are we are live what's up nathaniel how you doing today bro i'm doing pretty good how are you good man thanks for coming on i think this is episode five one of ones nathaniel lachance right yeah that's right <laughs> and we met uh officially for the first time in twitter spaces last week or two days ago yeah that would be like the voice i mean we had some replies there going on but uh that was about uh about it and you are currently on the low vitamin a diet or you've been on it you did it for a while uh i'd say low for about the last four months and then i've been moderately low almost just by accident for about a year and four months although yeah. there was still some consumption of like carrots and sweet potatoes which are really high in, in carotenoids in that last part so i'd say uh more specifically the last four months very cool so first question what did you eat today today uh for more this morning for breakfast i had beef rice um uh, that was pretty much all the food i and then i drank some water sweet and how did you how did you stumble upon this like what's your story there how did it all transpire hmm. i was going through a lot of different things uh at the time dealing with uh, an apartment that had some uh, mold growth in it um and then it all just kind of you know went down all the rabbit holes started going down all the rabbit holes about a couple of years ago um so uh first i started the kind of animal-based diet about a year four months ago when i discovered the works of paul saladino and so that's when i started going into uh, a lot of like high muscle meat um and uh, more so fruits rather than vegetables and if i had vegetables it was like roots and tubers and, and that sort of thing very cool so what did so what was the accident part you were like i kind of stumbled upon you were doing the diet accidentally that was that yeah like somewhat low vitamin a right because like fruits and muscle meat generally is low vitamin a and yeah. i couldn't even i couldn't tolerate eggs or dairy so there goes a lot of the retinol uh, sources right um yeah and so that's kind of accidentally lower vitamin a although one of the big issues was still a, a fair intake of of sweet potatoes and yeah. carrots which are extremely high carotenoids and uh but I, i'd have to say though like background throughout my entire life i was always eating you know, red peppers, spinach, yeah. uh, carrots and sweet potatoes, as well as eating multiple eggs every day. I was um, also drinking um, one and 2% dairy, which is fortified with retinol palmitate. So even just considering the food exposure before even taking a single vitamin A supplement, I was still taking and accumulating a huge amount of, of, of retinol from all of these sources. So um, I can easily see anyone getting into vitamin A toxicity state without even touching a supplement once. A huge yeah. issue I ran into was when I started taking cod liver oil. And then six months later, I tried some vitamin A supplementation for a couple of weeks and uh, that obviously did not end very well. Um, yeah. So we could get we could get into that but I mean just to just to kind of go over the history of exposure and um, you know there's there's some other environmental toxins that we could discuss but just as far as exposure to A that's what I would say um, that but I mean your question was more along the lines of like you know how did you um, discover all of this. And so as I started, you know, um, after I had taken the vitamin A supplementation and seeing the, the jaundiced skin that wow. I had, uh, the yellowing of the skin, uh, not too long after that, 
I was introduced to the works of Grant Genero and yeah. his three books. And uh, I was just absolutely fascinated by his books as soon as I started reading them, going over all the history of Eastern Canada and how Alzheimer's and Crohn's disease just like went in reverse, which almost never happens in our modern our our modern world. Yeah. Um, to see that happen in Eastern Canada after the cod fisheries closed was like a huge red flag. And I, I know like there is some amount of mercury toxicity in in like cod and and perhaps in the cod liver. But the vitamin A would be massively overshadowing that um, as like a real toxin source, um, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, we this this vitamin A toxicity conversation can get very convoluted and people get confused. We had a guy on the other day. This is just a prime example, guys, of how this can get out of balance and you can get to a dangerous level really unknowingly. We had a guy with a GNC multi-men's vitamin, which had, you know, the daily recommended RDA for vitamin A for men is like 900 micrograms, right? And even that we know is questionable. His multivitamin had 1,500 micrograms. It was like 160, 170% of the RDA. On top of that, he was taking cod liver oil, 13,000 IUs per tablespoon. Right. Then he was eating eggs, dairy, sweet potatoes, carrots, spinach, peppers, the rainbow diet. And you make that a daily habit. We start to see how people are really blindly poisoning themselves. Right. So, you know, I want to pump the brakes on what I'm doing a little bit as far as, you know, poison, 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 fear, fear, fear. And more of like, hey, be conscious, be cognizant, um, be aware that this thing is fat soluble, this thing bioaccumulates, gets stored in your liver, there's a quota, you know? And a lot of people now, like yourself, like myself, we reach that quota and um, we get, we get, you know, punished for it. What were some of like your symptoms, you know, um, that you were going through where you started to say like, hey, what's going on? Um, so the, in that January of last year, so that was about a year and four months ago, um, I started to get, um, numbing of the extremities. Uh, there was, uh, the yellowing of the skin. There was a, a large episode of IBS. Um, there was, um, many food intolerances, um, histamine intolerance, uh, you know, a, a lot of things that would be typical for a poisoning of multiple enzyme systems in the body. Um, you know, uh, not enough bile production to really emulsify fats. So after a fatty meal, you could kind of start burping, right? You know, that that's really indicative of liver damage, you know, not being able to emulsify those fats and get the benefits from some of these short chain fatty acids that are so crucial to um, our health and our hormones. And so, uh, yeah, those were some of the symptoms. Uh, I could probably think of some others, but you know, those were kind of the basic ones that kind of jump out. Yeah. And no, well said. And have those gone away? Are they going away? What's getting better? Like, what are you feeling since being on a low vitamin A diet? Uh, so pretty much everything that has resolved another market one would be chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, again, like even the chronic fatigue syndrome has, um, mostly went away and, uh, with also the introduction of certain minerals as well, um, to help, um, manage and, and detoxify vitamin A. Yeah. Some, you know, fixing the toxicities. Helping those deficiencies um, can go a long, long way. I'm happy for you, man. I'm proud of you. And um, thank you for coming on to talk about this. So when you read Grant, did you, you, you told me you read all three of Grant Jinru's works, his books, right? So like, what was your favorite one? And like, what are your, some of your main takeaways and like main sentences or passages or like, 
wow moments. You know, I know you talked about the Canadian fishery. You're Canadian, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that probably hit home. When I saw that, you know, Newfoundland area, once they shut the fishery down, like the Alzheimer's rates went down, you know, and then he compares it to Finland, where in Finland they have like one of the highest Alzheimer's rates in the world, like 52% or something. And then right over the border east to like Western Russia, there's nowhere near as much Alzheimer's. I think it's like three or four or five percent. And he's like, look, these guys eat cod and cod liver, high in vitamin A. And like these guys don't. Right. Um, and the, the reply guys will be like, correlation does not equal causation. And it's like, no, you know, these diseases are exponentially growing at a rapid rate. And it's something one group's doing and something another group's not doing you know so what were like your favorite what what was your favorite branch and root book and then like what was some of your takeaways from the books that stuck out to you well i think probably the first one just because it was so impactful um yeah. and you know just to hear about the stories of accutane and uh the similarities of the molecule you know retinoic <laughs> acid uh, and how similar that is to Accutane. It's, it's, it's identically the same and how that's a di identical to chemotherapy. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's all really interesting to see the whole retinoic acid because all carotenoids, you know, well, not all, I mean like a good, if your enzymes want to, they'll convert up to like 30% of it to retinol, which can still be like a huge amount and uh, that and then that becomes retinol and then once the liver gets overloaded it starts to produce retinoic acid and that spills over into the other organ systems but i mean it can still be toxic before then and i believe the body's always producing retinoic acid whether whether your liver gets overloaded or not right so it's it still can be a danger at every point but as far as favorite uh some of the favorite statements in the book um i like how we also did the, the connection to glyphosate and rates of autism. That was an interesting one to point out. That wasn't just strictly, you know, vitamin A. And, uh, you know, I know these, these two to toxicities can be fairly synergistic as well. Um, as far as glyphosate, you know, chelating certain minerals that are important for the detox of vitamin A, a lot of them, right? Zinc, um, copper. I know th there's the, uh, a lot of controversy about copper, but maybe we can get to that later. Um, when he just goes over things like like breast cancer and the explosion in breast cancer, and he goes over diseases like chronic kidney disease, uh, these are shocking. These are completely like you cannot ignore the fact that uh, chronic kidney disease is up massively. It's night and day. We had like what there's like 40 million people with chronic kidney disease in the United States. Now, um, breast cancer is, um, affecting so many women and it's sad. We know what's causing these breast cancers and uterine and ovarian cancers. We know it. And we're uh, some parts of our system that know what's going on, but are too cowardly to address what's going on are complicit for the genocide of millions of people and you know for grant to point out these huge like you know we see vitamin a fortification added to the milk boom this explosion of disease happens um you know and uh, right around the same time we see that they replaced uh the iodine that they were fortifying bread with with toxic bromide so uh, they replaced the white hat halide for the black hat one the bad one right and uh i think i think iodine and vitamin a have some synergies as well and so it's like a it's like a two punch to the gut it's like give them more of the toxin and less of the thing that might actually help them manage and excrete that toxin out of their body and so it, it really seems intent and I don't think doctors are necessarily evil people and such, but I think there's a very big, um, there's this hive mind and there's this control of our practitioners 
that they don't really want them to know. So there's confusion campaigns and, um, but there's, there's people pulling the strings at the top that are so evil. It's like sinister. Yeah. It's tough. Like you have doctors getting indoctrinated. No, listen in the, you know, in the 1970s in America and I, in Canada too, dairy started to get fortified with vitamin A palmitate. There was no reason to do that. Um, was it a conspiracy? I don't know. Is it a wrong move? Yes. Yes. In, in our opinion, in my opinion, totally unnecessary. Um, iodine. Yeah. The caking agent of bread and flowers used to be iodide. You'd, there was like five to seven milligrams per slice of bread, right? And iodide was in the bread and it was in the milk. And obviously the iodide is salt. We took it out of the milk. We took it out of the bread. It's only in the salt. Um, and we replaced it with a toxic halide, bromide, which actually clings to the iodine receptor in the body, right? So not only did we take away your iodine, we replaced it with something that's going to deplete you of it, right? It's like a double-edged sword. And this is why I say death by a thousand cuts. And this is why when people are like, oh, you're afraid, you're fear-mongering. I'm like, no, we're, we're shining the light on why you might be rocked why you might have disease, why you might be wrecked and low energy, low fatigue, name 50, 60 different conditions. A lot of times they, they go hand in hand and you're getting several at once and you're, you're becoming accustomed to living with some of them that you, they're just, uh, they're not like, it's natural to you now. You, you forget that it's even a problem. Um, but the way that our doctors are indoctrinated and you know become this kind of cultish white lab coat where they just follow procedures um you know how could they be looking at some of these original studies you know and and seeing that in the original rat studies of vitamin a deficiency tests they were actually feeding the rats milk casein and, and pork lard which now we know is retinoic acid you look at these studies and you right away within 30 seconds you're like oh these are severely flawed studies you know no and really like it's just the model right now is don't ask questions don't challenge the authority and uh, the reason for that is because if they do then there goes their license there goes their um, ability to practice medicine and their ability to, pro to provide for their family who wouldn't and that's why I say these doctors aren't aren't necessarily evil, is that that right. like you can't understand something that you're being specifically paid to not understand. Yeah. And so it's just it's control, right? And it's it's fear and control. And then if we have control over the authorities we have control over the population because the population looks to the people in the white lab coats with a huge amount of respect. And yep. that may not be necessarily wrong, but I mean, in another way, Hippocrates once said that if you're not your own doctor, you're a fool. So, you know, I, I'm not too sure, but I mean, that's fairly damning. I wouldn't go up to someone and tell them a fool for not being their own doctor. It's very difficult to be your own doctor in a world where you're confronted with 20 to 30 different toxins all in one day. And so, you know, it's just, it's baffling. And doctors are always baffled. And it's kind of funny, you know, baffled. All these kids are get SIDS two weeks after their vaccinations. Doctors are baffled. But it's like, they really are baffled because they're being paid to not understand and it's just all actually confusing to them and perhaps it's why doctors have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession is because yeah. you know you almost have to sell your soul to become a doctor and um these people actually need our help but i i don't know how exactly to help someone who is you know suffering from some sort of Stockholm syndrome. I, I don't know what to do. No, medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the West, you know, and um, that's not accounting for like, you know, misdiagnosis or, you know, and what we saw with COVID was medicine and health became political. 
you know, and politicized. We had a, a doctor that, you know, I wouldn't call the doctor anti-vax, but the doctor was very lenient and open-minded and would work with the parents, spacing them out, um, delaying them as long as they could, educating them. Um, and this is where kind of, you know, the anti-vax parents would, would go to this doctor. And then once COVID happened, it was a complete 180. It, it, it went from that to advertising the COVID vaccine for children. Um, and, you know, this particular person had a very um, political leaning towards the left, towards, you know, anti-Trump. And whatever your political um, stance is, you know, I saw a lot of my friends who I grew up with, you know, punk rock, anti-flag, you know, anti-establishment, um, you know, punk rock kids all of a sudden telling people to get a COVID vaccine because they hated President Trump. And I'm like, your, your hatred for a, a political leader should not throw your whole ideology out the window of like submitting to tyranny and being forced to inject a therapeutic thing into your body that's still an experiment, you know? Um, so that was very fascinating to watch in live time. But I think what's also happening is more and more people are becoming anti big pharma and anti modern medicine because the results are starting to speak for themselves and people are starting to get kind of fed up and people are starting to get let down. And um, I'll never forget, I was in um, a hospital and a family member, member was passing away, an elder, and in the room next door, a lady was dying of cancer. And, you know, she, she was maybe 50s, 60s, you know, and we're seeing younger and younger people die. But the lady was dying of cancer and her husband was like a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, very powerful, wealthy man. And he was like screaming at the doctors, you know, like, why? Why don't you know why this is happening? Why can't you fix it? You know, this was a wow. guy. Yeah, this was a guy who was used to, you know, snapping his fingers and getting an answer. And he was like, I went to the top colleges. I'm a CEO of this. I can figure this out. And he was like, why can't you guys figure this out? And I will, <laughs> I will never forget that combo. And I will never forget that feeling of this powerful man being helpless and then telling myself, like, I have to figure out a way for that never to be me, you know? And we do drive markets and it is still supply and demand. And if we do, we have to educate ourselves. We have to be the leaders of our own health. We have to be our own doctors and we have to get three and four and five opinions. You do have to study the, the ancient Hippocrates, the Chinese medicine, the Ayurvedic medicine, the, you know, the alternative medicine. But when people are going on their own, it's decentralized. It's scary. There's a reason people don't live in the forest by themselves. They want to be close to the hospital. They want to be close to the status quo and they want someone else to do the work for them and then just depend on the trusted source. Right. But when people are going away from big pharma and modern medicine more and more now, they're headed into alternative medicine, health food stores, supplements, and what which we're might yeah. have its own handful of of um, controlled opposition. Uh, there might be, you know, it, it, holistic medicine is going to have its own scans and grifts all of its own. And don't you go thinking for a second that pharma doesn't have their hands in that honey pot as well. So it's, you know, it's funny and that, that story you share is just, it's so moving and powerful. I, I love that story. And like I was watching um, Maestro um, with Bradley Cooper yeah. and uh, you know, his, his wife in the film um, gets breast cancer and, you know, my stomach just like dropped just that scene was so powerful. And like, just imagine like your own wife getting breast cancer. Like you never want that to be you. Like, and, yeah. and you could see how he was reacting. It's like, you know, instantly he like sprung to action. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll do the treatments and blah, blah, Like, well, you know, everything's going to be fine. We're going to be okay. But when you're already down that road so far, like cancer is like, that's an end stage disease. There's so many processes like, you know, insulin resistance and, you know, uh, failure of the cell to commit apoptosis because maybe the membranes and 
that are so saturated with omega-6 that it can't signal caspase-3 anymore to do that apoptosis. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much reactive oxygen species being generated by the mitochondria that they're just, it doesn't matter if you remove the tumor of one side of the body, it's a systematic disease. And yeah. that cancer is, is not, it, it's not that it's going to spread. It's that it's just only a matter of time before other cells break and mutate under the load of reactive oxygen species and tissue oxygenation is already low in other parts of the body that it, it, it's, it's a system wide disease and you can't just take a scalpel and cut it out and blast them with chemotherapy because that just is not a situation. And again, <laughs> it's just another form of vitamin A toxicity. So, you know, there are, you know, some people who, however, do respond well to chemotherapy, but it's like, oh, I feel better for this. Oh, I, I, it's terrible at first, but then, you know, you feel a little bit better after because, you know, perhaps you killed some of the cancer stem cells or it like, adjuvated some of your own stem cells to overgrow so it's just like this competitive relationship with the cancer and you maybe started a little a little if you were lucky but yeah. you know i think cancer is completely curable without without any form of chemotherapy and i think that even more importantly it's a lot easier to prevent it but it's curable it's definitely curable and i i uh, if if you catch it early enough in the disease process, it is curable. I mean, there is a lot of cases and some specific genetic defects where, you know, certain cancers might be unstoppable. But I think with some of the things you're shining a light on and some of the things that are, are starting to get lights shown on to them, such as, you know, like the explicit starvation of minerals from our soils yeah we're we're gonna discover some more things and make connections together as a community that as a whole we're going to be able to reverse cancers and there's going to be quick campaigns to try and stifle this development in confusion campaigns and attacks but once this movement gets going it's going to be unstoppable and doctors and nurses are already waking up to the fact that the system is crumbling vaccination rates are dropping across the countries and measles outbreaks are happening and they're in panic mode more so the powers that be that are in panic mode nurses and doctors i think are, are looking forward to a change in their employment i have nurses in my community you know i talk to doctors who are on board um, we, you know, we help nurses get better and nurses right away. Some of them are far gone and, you know, they're going to listen to the system, but other are pretty hip and wise to it. And their intuition is they're seeing these people come in all the time. You know, um, I'm seeing friends who I grow up with 40 years old, you know, passing away from cancer. That's not normal. You know, that's not genetics. That's something that we're doing wrong to ourselves. Um, and really, it's going to take, you know, we as a people coming together, discussing these matters. No one's coming to save us. No doctor is going to come on the TV um, because the way this works, like, you know, we can't even say the word cure. We can't even say the word cure in the same sentence as a disease because they actually own the names of the disease. They own the rights. Right. So you can't come on their property and say you have what well, we what well, we have to say and come from a different angle of preventative root cause you know we're taking preventative measures to like you said avoid that end game you know where your body's creating tumors and, and what we're seeing is the body creates a tumor because it's creating a package to put more toxins in basically your liver has been saturated with toxins everything is overflowing the body's like, hey, I got to create new areas to store this junk, you know, and the worse you put in this junk, the more I'm going to create these areas to store it, you know, and if you stop putting in the junk and fix the deficiencies, like you said, then your body's like, OK, now I can work again, get rid of this junk, you know, and it, it, it's not going to be a 
few week process, like blasting your body with chemo, it's going to be a marathon, you know, two, three, four, maybe five years where your body's going to slowly start dumping, you know, toxins and poisons. And then you're going to open up your detox pathways and your body's going to do just what it was designed to do. You know, and this is why today I posted that stretching is a, is a scam or that stretching is making you weak. And listen, I'll still stretch sometimes. I'll still do a 10 minute walk for a warm up. But what I'm really trying to say is when you're 20, 30, 40 years old, you should not be feeling stiff and achy and need a whole 20 minute routine of foam rolling and breaking up the knots and stretching. You know, I don't know about you, but one of the benefits I've had since being months into a low vitamin E diet is I'm, I'm more flexible. I'm less stiff. I'm more um, mobile and supple. Did you are you feeling that, too? Or did, were you just always kind of naturally flexible? Because some people growing up, you know, you'd have that kid doing a full split. You'd have people who could touch their toes like like it was nothing. And I was never I was never naturally flexible. And I would kind of always in the back of my mind be like, why, why can some people do this? And I can't like, what, why am I like, every time I would go into a catcher stance and crouch, my knees would pop, you know, I cut out nightshades, I go light in May, my knees no longer pop. It's like, oh, okay. And they'll say causation doesn't equal correlation. It's like, no, for me, that worked. And I'm no longer having this thing that I just accepted as being like my thing. That is the way my body reacts, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. It's like, so the theory is that vitamin A is required for stem cell differentiation. So like cell proliferation, uh, immune modulation, it's required for um, like osteoclast activity to like do bone remodeling, that it's required for the thyroid, um, that it's required to produce mucus in the intestinal lining. And I think there's a way to refute all of these. And like, so, but it, it's like, so is it actually essential for these things? Or is it really just a cheat code to try and force the body to create more stem cells to just like to force it in a way that it actually doesn't really want. And you could use other things and that like, you know, I, I like to kind of perhaps reference vitamin A as like, it's like a backup nutrient and it's like if you're like acutely ill and you have uh an encephalitis that's about to kill you then you know you take the vitamin a and your body uses that as a nuclear bomb to drop on the encephalitis but you know is using the nuclear bomb option the best you know like we talk about uh, creating ceruloplasmin in the liver, which is something that, um, you know, Morley Robbins says is, you know, it's required to be able to mount copper and, and have that copper carrier protein. But it really seems that the liver is capable of doing that on its own and creating ceruloplasmin without any vitamin A at all. And it's like, it's kind of like Jason Homel quoted something that said that like, it's like throwing, it's like you can get a building to start repairing its own windows by throwing rocks at the windows, but it might not be like the best way to have the building manager repair the windows. Like it, it, you, you might be more productive if you were to literally just, you know, start replacing or fixing the windows <laughs> that you know so it's it's like an adjuvant or like a pro hormone or some it's like yeah. this backup thing that we don't necessarily need and like say say we did need just like some tiny amount of it like does that mean it's really essential for all our functions it's it's hard to and i'd love to get into a nuanced discussion and try and like play devil's advocate and such but it just, it gets, the more you dig in it, the harder and harder it gets to support it um, as, yeah. as an essential. Yeah. I don't know if it's an essential or it just happens to be in everything. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just part of who we are as human, our human experience on planet earth. And maybe it's part of, you know, why we are human and why we don't live forever. 
you know, it's like the yin to the yang. And it's like that little small black dot in the white part of like, yeah, like there's got to be something to throw you guys out. Um, when we talk about the what you said with the surreal plasmin, and it's like, yeah, they'll come on the screen and they'll say, hey, um, this anti-aging supplement boosts your immune system. And what they're not telling you is like, yeah, because your immune system is coming out to fight what you just put inside it. You know, yeah. that's, that's why it's boosting your immune system. It's like, oh, you take this and, it, and your immune system is really starts to be overactive. And that's not a good thing. You know, they say, oh, this is an antioxidant. But what we see and know is that our immune system is oxidative, you know, oxidative, um, like requires oxygen and and these processes and you know when we t have this essential combo is vitamin a essential grant jin rue nine years on a low vitamin a diet his serum level is at zero when you go to the doctor and get blood work in, a, in the states anything under 20 is deficient and anything under 10 is severely deficient you know warning signs you are in trouble you're gonna go blind and he's actually had the opposite happen. His night vision improved. His strength is improved. You know, his cognitive function is improved. And, you know, some of the symptoms that I think I'm, I care about the most with vitamin A toxicity is the anger, is the depression, the anxiety, you know, the social anxiety, the, the, the suicidal thoughts. And you see this on the side effects of Accutane. You see all those symptoms. You know, and you hear heart, you know, you guys want to check out something, type in Accutane horror stories. You know, this is what happens when somebody who uh, already probably had a saturation level at a high point mega doses vitamin A or retinol, you know. And what we're seeing, you know, we're only five episodes into this podcast, but majority of the people who come on say they they are no longer anxious or they're they're more happy or they're more at peace and more present. And Chinese medicine, once again, says if you have a toxic liver, you're going to be an angry person. And for some people, you know, you have under methylators and over methylators and everyone kind of um, expresses these things different. For some people, it's not anger. Maybe it's sadness. You know, maybe it's uh, depression. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe their anger isn't like out into the world, but it's like more inward onto themselves. You know. Yeah, no, it's interesting. All of the kind of behavioral changes as it relates to toxicity and how this, even the same toxicity can create a different behavioral pattern in someone. Like perhaps someone has variations in their histamine handling enzymes, and then like that could that could produce like rage in them, <laughs> or um, you know, just like different you know assertiveness or introversion extroversion and that kind of thing and and tendencies i mean i mean i think most of the time it's it liver damage can result in isol like isolatory tendencies where you just don't want to be with people a lot of the time um yeah no it's it's super interesting and like the whole like pro-oxidation anti-oxidation discussion is is pretty interesting as well because i mean to run certain processes i think like you mentioned your body does have to oxidize certain things um so you have like to create collagen you need like lysol oxidase it's like almost like a welder you know it's got to come in and like you know put these these ligaments and fold these proteins together but then you need an antioxidant to come and clean up, clean up all that debris that's created from that process. And so you're like you're balancing things um, between you know pro-oxidation, antioxidation, and you have all of these byproducts being made like superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, um, and hydrogen sulfide, which is like an interaction between sulfur and sulfites with hydrogen peroxide that kind of create it. So you need certain enzymes to be running like like superoxide dismutase enzymes run by manganese and copper and like in some situations i think my my perspective on copper toxicity would be 
someone has so much vitamin A stored in their liver that any amount of copper will push vitamin A out of the liver. And if you don't have enough zinc to keep the stability of retinol binding protein together, and you don't have enough manganese, then that copper will initiate a toxic pathology. But if you have enough of the cofactors, um, this copper won't be, but I would still recommend like from my perspective, unless you, so, so say you've had a history of high vitamin A for a really long time and uh, you have symptoms of vitamin A toxicity, you, it might take years for you to detox before you can safely even introduce the slightest amount of copper but it's always going to be need to be balanced with enough zinc. And I think if, if anyone has any fears with copper, um, you know, as long as you take like five to 10 times the amount of zinc, if your liver and your body is stressed out, your liver is going to create enough of a protein called metallothionine. And you're going to just shoot that copper straight out through urine. So, if you have enough zinc, like you will be, and manganese, like you will be protected. But again, like those two, like copper and manganese run superoxide dismutase enzymes that create hydrogen peroxide. So then you down the chain, you need enough glutathione, which is, uh, you know, you're going to need selenium and molybdenum to be able to run the, those enzymes and reduce that hydrogen peroxide to water. But then your thyroid also needs that hydrogen peroxide as well for TPO, um, thyroid peroxidase. And you need enough iodine and selenium and all of these things to run the thyroid properly. And zinc and, is also, you know, important and magnesium and a little bit of copper. And so, you know, if, I mean, I've, I've seen you discuss a lot about, you know, and warning people about the dangers of isolating only one mineral. So if you isolate only one mineral, you take only iodine, but you neglect the others, well, you, you could run into a lot of issues. If you took only copper, but ignored all of the others, you could run into some serious issues. And, you know, it is wise to be warning people, hey, don't isolate just one mineral. You're going to get yourself into trouble. And so, yeah, kudos to you for warning people about that. And yeah. it's really important that people understand that. Yeah, well said. It's balance in all things. You know, anything not in balance will be quickly brought back to reality and sometimes in like a very dangerous, painful way. I was seeing way too many health influencers isolating minerals, um, recommending supplementing with copper. And it's like you are a super dangerous human who is doing a one size fits all approach with strangers lives and you have no idea what their blood level is. You have no idea what their uh, seroplasm and their binding protein. You have no idea what their zinc to copper ratio is. You have, you've never seen their hair mineral test. You have no idea what their symptoms are. And you see a guy like Dr. William Walsh. I don't know if you're familiar with William Walsh, but his work on zinc and copper is just incredible. He's going into prisons and, helping violent offenders you know seeing that is he the one who developed the walsh protocol uh talked a lot about methylation yeah mm. yeah yeah no he no he certainly is interesting um and I, i'm not sure what i think about the whole over methylation under methylation uh theory and you know, i think i think a lot of people have blockages in their methylation systems but I, I have a difficulty believing in this day and age that anyone is over methylating. I think it's more so just like, you know, you've got one enzyme that's over activating, say like it's like the cystathione beta synthase enzyme that creates glutathione, but then like it's also connected to sulfur. If one part of it's not working and you've got too much sulfur and then not enough glutathione, you're going to get like a lot of issues. And... Yeah like the whole like mineral balancing thing, like, you know, there are minerals that can affect methylation, like copper can actually be problematic for uh, adenosine, uh, 
yeah. glutamine enzyme. And so, you know, for some people, they might get actually, some people might fix their insomnia with copper and some people's insomnia might get worse with copper. So that's again, where, where it becomes very individual and that is connected to the methylation cycle. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things that are tricky. I think when you say, you know, you have to listen to someone's symptomology, I think that's bang on. That's a hundred percent. Um, you can't just like push people through detoxes if they're not feeling well, you got to figure out some way to support them with another cofactor to try and, and resolve their symptomology. But I think blood serum and hair mineral tests can be while accurate, their interpretation can be um, a little dicey. And, you know, I see a lot of issues with blood serum tests. And like, even if someone retin someone's serum retinol goes low, they might still have vitamin A toxicity, but it's just stored in the organs. And for some reason, they have a certain genetic variation where their serum retinol just doesn't go up. And then some people have higher serum retinol just naturally, just genetically. And, you know, so that could be an issue. And then you can see copper really high in blood and someone start copper dumping. Um, but that could be the body's trying to send copper to places where it needs it and they're healing. Or it could actually just be copper dumping where the person is too stressed out. Um, they're working nine to five, they're burning out and copper is just getting shot out the hair. And you know, that's, that's a sign of high stress, high cortisol. If someone's got high blood copper and it's not maybe necessarily that the copper is toxic, but that the context of their body is just toxic and they need to wait perhaps a little longer to introduce copper and work on getting those other toxins down first or just support that copper intake with a much higher ratio of zinc so that the copper so that so that the, if the body needs to it can just shoot some zinc or some copper out to urine and like even like hair mineral analysis like if the sodium and potassium levels are not in balance or, or something's high and like and it's shooting out a lot of like it very low magnesium. Again, they, they could be very stressed out. Uh, other toxins they're stressing them out. They have high cortisol. And so they just burn through their magnesium and magnesium is one that, you know, seems to be, but I, I saw you were suggesting some magnesium chloride, which is cool. Cause you can just do it topically, right? You don't have to take it. Orally. Yeah. You just rub it on. That could be useful for someone who's got high cortisol perhaps. Yeah. You know, I, I, so I, when I probably 10, 15 years ago, when I first started getting magnesium, I remember a few big account guys saying topical and we would get the spray. And the issue with the spray is it's hard to be compliant with it because not everyone loves the residual effect and the oily effect. It can be itchy. It can be a little bit, it can burn if you have a sensitive area. Um, but it wasn't until I got reintroduced after I read Grant Shenru's book got reintroduced to Dr. Garrett Smith. And Dr. Garrett Smith is a, a master curator, as well as just literally the nutrition detective. That's his moniker. And he's uh, the best at finding out what's really moving the needle. And one of the things that he's seen in his patients and his years of practice is the only thing that really moves the needle with 90%, 95% of his patients is the topical magnesium chloride. He says it's, it's an outlier that can take the oral magnesium and their levels go up. He says that the oral is great for pooping and eliminating. So you don't necessarily, it's not gonna be a bad thing, but he says, as far as raising the magnesium levels, the topical magnesium, you know, and I either get clients and, and community members, I get them on magnesium oil. I get them on Dr. Garrett Smith's magnesium lotion or magnesium bath magnesium chloride in the bath and pretty much everyone right away week one week two is like oh my god i feel so much better you know and that's because of the the calcium to magnesium ratio and most people's magnesium is way down here and their calcium's here you start to get their magnesium here you start to get their magnesium even a little bit above it 
all of a sudden they're less calcified, all of a sudden they're less cramping, they're less stiff, they're more relaxed, their nervous system can finally breathe and, and be calm, they're not short circuiting as much. Um, Potassium chloride can also be really good for that too, but some people run into like heart palpitations and such, per, maybe just because they're like B1 or magnesium deficient. That or, means, you uh, took, yeah, you took too yeah. much. You did too much. What I like to do is I'll put a little potassium chloride in the magnesium bath. Um, this morning after my run, I did a one eighth teaspoon of potassium chloride in like a quart of water. You know, so very, very micro dose. What people have to realize, too, in our approach, we're doing less harm. We're taking the safe route. If you just went 30 years without supplementing this this thing, you shouldn't just dive in the deep end and start dumping it into your body. You know, you should gradually just how you got to crawl before you walk and walk before you run. Just how you have to do some push ups before you start bench pressing heavy weights and you see this a lot with zinc where, you know, a guy will get on zinc and just start feeling amazing. And then he'll just start mega dosing the zinc. You know, I even made that mistake, you know, back in the day in my twenties where I would take 15 or 30 milligrams, feel the effects right away of, you know, the libido and the, you know, the other stuff. And you're like, Ooh, I want more of that, you know, and you end up throwing those balances. Everything is a delicate balance. Everything is a practice. And this is, you know, just how you train your body, just how you train your mind, you got to train your your medicine. You got to train, you know, your health. You got to train your sharpen your sword and see what works best for you and stop playing guessing games and stop blindly following marketers and influencers. Every day there's a new supplement or new pill or, you know, I, I got fed up because every day someone's texting me or emailing me this new superfood or super pill or anti-aging thing or this secret. And yeah, they think you're missing some sort of polyphenol and that's why you don't feel good with vitamin A. And that really kind of grinds my gears. So a bunch of people recommending things that are not essential. So like – all these polyphenols like, oh, do you, you should try this resveratrol or quercetin or, or, or turmeric or, you know, some sort of anti-inflammatory or some sort of herbal supplement or, you know, uh, some sort of tincture extracted from this plant. It's like this oil or like all of these things, like are those essential nutrients for your body? Like did you even like even just do an analysis on chronometer and see like, Okay, where am I at with my my B vitamins, my fat soluble vitamins, my minerals? Although you don't need the some of the fat soluble vitamins, you'd be careful with. Um, but where am I at with my my macro and micronutrients? Just the basic things I just need to live. And you know, I think most people will find that actually your your diet is lacking. You don't even need to do a blood test. My diet is lacking. Like. You shouldn't be wasting a doctor's time with blood tests unless you've actually done your due diligence and you've checked what in your diet, like, like do an analysis at least just for one week and see like, where are you coming short? And, you know, if you're coming short in a few, not all the RDAs are entirely accurate. There's some that need to be a lot lower and some that need to be a lot higher. But, you know, are you just hitting your basic targets? Like, we shouldn't be, like, agonizing and worrying about these things and, like, all of these new extracts and supplements we could be eating when we're just not even looking. We're, we haven't even done an essay of the essentials in our life. It's just crazy. It's, it's it nonsense. Is. And it's recommended daily allowance. They're recommending this amount. It's a vague, you know, it's legalese. Some people call it the rat and drug administration because a lot of these, <laughs> you know, it's recommended on rat studies, um, you know, and it varies person to person. So what minerals do you like? What minerals have you taken that have kind of, and this is obviously not medical advice. Please don't go out and just copying Nathaniel, but take what he's saying with a grain of salt and, you know, he's gotten better and this is his story. 
So what minerals did you take along your low vitamin A journey that kind of you think helped the process and getting you uh, better along the ride? Okay. So I'll start with maybe some of like my dietary context first and tell you what I'm eating again. So again, I'm eating a lot of meat. So that's about a pound of muscle meat per day. So yeah. that means I'm getting a lot of iron and so, but even if you're not eating meat, I still think that, you know, in some cases you, you might, you might still get a lot of iron. Um, and so I'm also getting a lot of like creatine. I'm getting a lot of vitamin B3 niacin and a lot of the B vitamins in general. So I don't really take very much B vitamins. Um, I microdose. I'll actually break up a B complex and spread it out over like 10 or 15 magnesium pills and then take one of those a day. So I'm only getting just tiny amounts of uh, B vitamins. And right now I'm not really doing much folates or B12 or very much B6 or B5 um, just because I, I can see that I, I'm going into the B vitamins here. So like as far as minerals, I'm essentially taking all of them um, in small amounts uh, except for iron. So you know, I'm taking um, molybdenum, iodine, selenium, uh, chromium. Um, I'm not taking cobalt because cobalt is part of B12, right? Cobalamin. Um, so I'm getting that from the meat. Uh, so right, I'm taking a small amounts of oral magnesium now, and I'm doing like topical magnesium chloride. And then I'm, I'm sprinkling little bits of potassium chloride on all my food um, and trying to balance with salt. Um, Cause I know your, your cells kind of require a balance between salt and potassium. And I have never done radical changes in potassium intake because that's actually what kind of causes the heart palpitations. So you, like you, you, you're changing like the electrochemistry at that point, if you're just going crazy with potassium, um, what other minerals, e essentially just all of them. Um, yeah, I think the zinc. The yeah. zinc is really important, especially if you're taking any amount of copper. Uh, I do take a little bit of copper, but I'm always watching for how I'm feeling. If I'm feeling any vitamin A detox symptoms, I'll pull back on the copper and take a bunch of zinc um, to rebalance that. Because, you know, I, I, again, copper can be, I think copper is perhaps one of the most min misunderstood um, nutrients, but it also can be very dangerous um, just because of how quickly it induces vitamin A detox. And if you know, you know anything about vitamin A is that detoxing vitamin A needs to be done uh, slowly. If you try and rush it, um, you know, you could, you could cause some issues and um, right, like cellular damage, um, right? Because it can damage your, um, your mRNA, it can damage your mitochondria. Um, but Small amounts of copper are still required for mitochondrial function, so in cytochrome C oxidase. But yeah. I, I would like to kind of do an appeal to, like, first get the fluoride and the glyphosate out of your life before doing copper, because uh, you might figure out that you don't even need to take copper if you're, you're getting rid of the things that remove it from your body. So you. you Again, and even all of these minerals, if you're eating a lot of meats and you can soak and pressure cook beans and you're still able, able to eat beans, beans can be a good source of molybdenum and a lot of the other minerals, and you might not need to supplement any minerals. But I, I find that iodine, because we're not living coastally a lot of the time, is very difficult to get. And... Um, I don't supplement too, too much of it right now because potassium iodide is um, challenging energetically. 
So you need a, a mixture of elemental iodine and potassium iodine, and they'll call this like a Lugo solution. Um, and there's different brands that sell this, um, but it's really just like a mix that some doctor came up in the early 1900s because he found that potassium iodide wasn't necessarily working for people because in nature and, you know, in seafood, you will find some elemental iodine as well. And so you, you can't just extract some certain thing somewhere and then forget that in nature, actually, this was with this. And so it's really important to kind of, in a way, emulate nature. It, for some people, it's, it's really hard to become mineral proficient. If your entire life you've mostly eaten processed foods and um, foods grown by big agriculture that are grown with pesticides because um, a lot of the, of the fungal species in the soil get poisoned and then you don't get those mycorrhizal fungi that bring the minerals up to the surface and then they give a bunch of nitrogen to the plants and phosphorus at the top so the roots just stay at the top because they can just get everything they need there and they never have to dig the roots down into the soil to actually reach and go get those minerals that you need. So I think some amount of mineral supplementation would be important. And it, I'd say if you're vitamin A toxic, start first by removing the toxins, then introduce small amounts of minerals, perhaps without copper and wait a little while later to introduce, um, some amount of copper and you know if you have any heavy metal toxicity like mercury it can be also challenging um but if if you remove all of the toxic halogens from your body and you remove heavy metals or you don't have much exposure to those your body might be happy with just the natural amount of copper you get from your food so you might not need any of it yeah, I wouldn't touch copper. I think there's a, I look at copper the same way I look at vitamin A. I do not think it's essential at all. I think it just happens to be there. You look at the, the zinc to copper ratio, nature is eight to one. You know, pumpkin seeds have a lot of zinc and a little bit of copper. Um, the foods that have that ratio out of whack, I avoid chocolate, uh, carob, um, you know, certain shellfish. But with that said, I would never supplement it, but I know it's in, you know, there's some in lamb, there's some in the meats, there's some in the other foods I eat. Um, the minerals I'm really looking to that I care about are zinc, um, selenium, molybdenum, which is a huge one. Molybdenum, you know, is amazing for candida and helping detox sulfates and sulfides. Um, it's a very unknown mineral. Yeah. It's a very unknown trace mineral is essential that can work wonders at the right amount a low dose you start you start taking too much and bad things can happen but potassium you know i've had people ask me about potassium and when you get the right amount of potassium in your body your body can really start working again you know it's a it's a mineral that's essential for normal cell function and most healthy people my opinion should aim for 4000 to 4700 milligrams a day but very few Americans in, in the West get this amount. And I've even seen experts in studies suggest that 2% of people get an adequate amount of potassium daily. Um, and it's not as easy as you'd think to optimize your levels. And by the way, if you're vitamin A toxic, your potassium is going to take a hit. You know, So I focus it on it in my diet as well as supplementation. Um, you know. The experts, if you go what foods are high in potassium, it happens to be a lot of vitamin A foods or nightshade foods, you know, apricots, spinach, potatoes. These will be some of the suggested foods. Same with magnesium. The experts will suggest leafy greens. Eat your leafy greens for magnesium. But you're also having a vitamin A food there. And if you're already toxic, that's not going to help. So where I go for potassium is bananas and coconut water, you know, a clean source. Um, obviously, I do organic apples sometimes. And, you know, once in a while, I might do a peeled white potato um, just to get my potassium. But what's interesting about potassium is you're supposed to get around 4,000 to 4,700 milligrams a day. There's around 400 milligrams of potassium per banana. So you'd have to eat around 8 to 11 bananas just to hit that mark. 
that's crazy. Um, if some days you have no choice, you know, hey, and you want to eat two bananas per meal and see how you feel, try it. You want to eat one banana per meal and then some coconut water, see how you feel. Um, but signs of potassium deficiency, brain fog, muscle cramps, high blood pressure, uh, water retention, heart palpitations, like you mentioned, high blood sugar, constipation. A lot of people will get their potassium right and they'll say, hey, I'm not constipated anymore. Um, muscle weakness. You know, if you're a guy in the gym and you're plateaued, take a close look at your potassium too. Um, fatigue and getting tired after a meal. A lot of times, you know, for me, I would get tired after meals and we blame carbs or we blame this or that. For me, getting my potassium right, I never get tired after meals anymore. And then it's another thing with anxiety, depression. And yeah, the 50-50 salt mixture, you could mix salt and potassium chloride you could put that in food or water, you know, and go low, go slow. I think 360 milligrams is about an one eighth of a teaspoon, right? So that's how I'm looking at potassium. That's how I'm looking at these other minerals. I don't want to supplement with copper because of the doctors I follow, like William Walsh and Dr. Garrett Smith. They have so much data and so much testing they've done majority of human beings out there, I don't want to get a one size fits all approach for everyone, but this is good for the public to know, majority are zinc deficient and copper toxic or copper overlord or- Yeah, but like I'm going to have to push back on that because from what I've heard, I've listened to a lot of Dr. Garrett's podcasts, um, yeah. the, the way he's diagnosing copper toxicity is he's doing blood and he's doing hair mineral tests. And just because someone is dumping copper high in the hair and their blood is high in copper does not necessarily um, create the image or story of copper toxicity. And But before I go deeper how into much that. Is unbound. It's how much is unbound. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like iron. So iron is even more reactive. Copper does have some reactivity to it and engages in the Fenton reaction, right? Which, which uh, as we were talking about earlier, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen sulfide, once they two bump up together, they interact with lipids like omega-6s or hydrogenated vegetable oils. That's when it, like you're, you're initiating the Fenton reaction and you're creating hydroxyl radicals. And that's, that's, that is the primary toxin when we see all of these symptoms of copper toxicity on the reality at the root of it is the generation of hydroxyl radicals and now say if someone's also deficient in molybdenum well then they're not processing like you said earlier they're not pr processing sulfur properly and detoxifying sulfites and um as we so Yes, iron is extremely reactive. Copper is somewhat reactive. And depending on the context, if the body has a lot of reactive oxygen species in it, if you throw copper into there, you're, you're going to create a toxin inside of that. But um, I, I wouldn't necessarily put vitamin A and copper in the same category while copper can be toxic in, in many contexts and is probably toxic for most people right now just because we don't have the appropriate environment inside of our body and so vitamin a is required for zero enzymes that we know of vitamin a is not essential to the function of any enzyme in the human body however copper is essential for ceruloplasmin, it's essential for cytochrome C oxidase, it's essential for lysol oxidase that creates collagenous tissues. But it seems that if our body is extremely healthy and we don't have halogens and heavy metals and glyphosate in our body, that we might not need that much copper. But again, if you're really healthy, you might actually be able to introduce more copper into your body and turn on certain processes. Some people, when they initially start with copper, their estrogen actually goes up. And this is a sign of toxicity, right? And it could be a sign that you're zinc deficient. So you, you work on your zinc first and then maybe add copper in later. 
but copper is so essential for oxidation processes in the body that I don't think it can necessarily be ignored. And uh, I don't think it's, it should be considered as a toxin and nothing but a toxin, but you know, it, it should be, it should be approached very carefully. And I appreciate that you're sharing a lot of um, caution and concern with people online because people do sometimes jump into things too quickly. But I, I think it's it's worth a further investigation. And Mr. Walsh and Mr. Smith um, are not bringing real science to the table and are not talking about the Fenton reaction, the generation of hydroxyl radicals, um, and literally just the fact that, you know, copper, when you if you throw copper in the mix and your body's full of polyunsaturated fats and uh, hydrogenated fats, um, then, you know, you, you actually talk a lot about epithelial tissue and the importance of how, you know, vitamin A just destroys epithelial tissue. And we need it for like our blood brain barrier. We need it for our intestinal lining. We need it to create skin and connective tissue and, and bones are, a lot of it is collagen and connective tissue. And so we need copper to build all of these things. But manganese is also important, right? It's like also important for lysyl oxidase. But copper, I think, is the primary. And copper is also important for the stability and production of retinol binding protein as well. Uh, but zinc is the primary for that. And so that's why we, we often refer to zinc. But I think it's it's really important to stress that it's the environment as a whole that makes for a toxic experience with copper and that, you know, as we address these things, you know, maybe right now only a few percent of the population is eligible to increase their copper a little bit. But as, you know, people like you keep doing their work and we start healing people and reducing their toxicity, maybe four or five or six or 10 percent of people might be eligible to start taking copper again. It used to be in our food in much higher quantities and even animal liver used to be higher in copper and lower, perhaps lower in vitamin A. One of the issues though is that I would never eat liver and I would never eat kidney ever just because there's never going to be an appropriate amount of vitamin. It's always going to be too much. But yeah, anyways, I, I think copper deserves more investigation and, and, um, yeah, and and still the same caution and concern that you also express. No, yeah, you know, I think, listen, th what Dr. William Walsh and Dr. Garrett Smith are doing with copper, I consider it real science because they are finding out that people's levels are way out of whack. Um, Dr. But how do they assess levels? You know, you're not going to be doing tissue biopsies in a lot of people. You're mostly just going to be do, doing blood draws, hair they're, mineral they're, analysis, and urine. They're practicing doctors who have thousands of results. You know, um, they're studying autism patients. Uh, Dr. William Walsh is studying violent offenders. And people might say this is not real science, but he's helping autism ch parents of children with autism I think what they're doing is real right. science. Getting their zinc levels right, finding a child who has a, a copper overload, fixing it with zinc and other methods of eliminating it, and then all of a sudden these people are feeling better, right? So that to yeah, me, which makes which yeah. makes sense, and uh, they are. Uh, um, my comment is that I think they're not bringing some real science on the topic of copper to the table, but they are practicing real science and they are helping people. And yeah. I think the issue is more so copper metabolism because it, it, you know, say you find copper in cancer tissue or you find high copper yeah. in someone who's autistic or you find, you know, in someone who's got Wilson's disease, I think it more comes down to the fact that their body is not metabolizing and utilizing the copper correctly. So in that case, the right move might be to reduce their intake of copper and increase zinc for a time. But then as you remove toxins, 
that there there might be a time but copper also helps you remove toxins so the thing is is like maybe you shouldn't deprive yourself of copper if you have the money and you know the the knack to be able to increase your amount of zinc that much higher to make up for it because then you're just gonna you're gonna create more metallothionine which at the same time is gonna help you get mercury arsenic lead cadmium out of your body and then your liver might be less stressed out and might actually be able to metabolize and utilize the copper effectively so it's like they're in a way they're right but in what context and in what time in as we remove toxins copper may, will not be a toxin anymore yeah i'll show you some studies where you know scientists doctors pretty much prove there's no need for copper it just happens to be there but then you look at things like copper in the drinking water and bathing water um people who grew up living in copper pipes if you have copper pipes in your home you have that green film on your shower and your sink you know copper in your water is a very very bad thing and if you take actions to remove it reverse osmosis filter distiller you know i think cooking water takes a little bit care of it bathing water is obviously tricker more tricky um shower filters um you know copper is without a shadow of a doubt copper is really messing people up like it it, it just is you know and it's i think it looks like that because we're seeing high copper excretion levels in urine we're seeing it in feces we're seeing it in blood tests and hair mineral analysis but those are all just endpoints and it's a lot more expensive to actually do tissue studies and biopsies it's also more invasive and it's painful and so we're not seeing and the thing is like just because you find a high presence of copper in someone who is sick you're finding that high presence of copper in their blood and in their hair and perhaps in their urine um it but it's more so an it indication that they've tumor. been poisoned and they don't have they don't have they've lost their metabolism of copper but you have to ask yourself why is copper showing up in people's tumors so the, the body's protecting you and forming a shield storing it away as another mechanism right the body's had enough oh i'm going to dump this in a foreign well, body tumor the cancer that's cells not a good can be copper smart showing themselves up, as copper well and in tumor copper showing up in tumor is not a good thing so that's cancer not. cells need copper they uh these guys have their own brain they're smart and they need copper to reproduce and so that's bad giving copper yeah it is it is bad <laughs> uh it's bad for the person who has cancer um but I believe that cancer cells are adapting because of a toxic environment. So, uh, so, so uh, you have a, a non-cancerous cell who is starved of oxygen and is insulin resistant. So it's like, I'm going to adapt. I'm going to switch to anaerobic glycolysis. So I'm going to be able to now thrive in an oxygen depleted environment. And I have 90 times the amount of glucose receptors. So I'm going to be able to proliferate in so many different ways now. And I'm going to suck up a bunch of copper because I need that to be able to reproduce. Yeah. But in someone whose body is well taken care of, is oxygenated, is not insulin resistant, those tumors aren't going to develop. And our cells need the copper. Cancer cells need copper. But our cells also need copper. But if you you limit the ability for cancer to happen in the first place, you're you're going to be able to utilize the copper. And so, say say someone does have cancer, well, they need to reverse their insulin resistance so that their cells can accept the glucose quicker than the cancer cells can uptake it. They don't necessarily have to switch to a keto diet although that might be helpful for a little bit anyways not medical advice but yeah it like that whole process that's happening is you know it it's it's crazy and you know just because just because you find 
you know, copper in a, in a cancer tissue doesn't in higher concentrations than you would find it in normal tissue doesn't mean that the copper is toxic. It's that cancer cells require copper to be able to proliferate and they're smart and they're going to grab that copper from you and they're going to steal a lot of other things from you as well. Yeah. What we're also seeing is low blood copper in a person is usually that means they have a worse liver health, you know, and like you said, you can't tell with blood because they could have way more stored in their liver. Same thing with vitamin A, right? So when you do all these three different tests, four different tests, you have to look at symptoms and you, in a lot of ways, people are defying science or experts and doing what's right for them and what's best for them and, and you know, the safest approach for them, you know? And for most people, when you look at William Walsh's work, it's, it's undeniable of the results he's getting and when you look at the imbalance, there's just, you have a zinc deficiency fact and you have an abundance of copper, you know, and the, the, the ratio is eight to one, you know? Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. We do need to um, fix the environment first and that needs to be first priority. People need to do, you know, pretty much all of the things you're saying, improve, you know, so there's zinc and molybdenum and uh, and eliminate their vitamin a and and uh, i mean you eat like more so ancestral foods like uh, you know like low vitamin a generally you, ancestrally you probably wouldn't have been eating that much vitamin a either and so doing all of these things improves the environment of your body and enables all of these things even even your iron metabolism like a lot of people who damage their liver with vitamin a Will then also have iron overload because their liver's not working anymore and um iron overload impairs the utilization of copper um it makes it impossible for your body to utilize copper without hurting itself and so like again vitamin a like makes copper toxic and so if people do what you're what you're telling them for a good number of time and they have some patience, I think a number of years down the line, they'll be able to take copper and actually get a benefit from it. But it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of the hard work that you're doing to be able to get there. And it is a nuanced discussion. We might discover more things in the future, but I think you know, I think Dr. Walsh and Dr. Smith have totally shut out the possibility for a nuanced discussion here. And, you know, I think I think they should be willing to reopen that um, and not not just use, you know, cert certain arguments that, you know, just because we find it in in autistic or people with Wilson's disease or in cancer tumors, that like these aren't scientific justifications for why copper is toxic. We have to look at the enzymes and see what enzymes use it. And then what toxins impair the utility of copper in the body and actually make it so that cancer cells end up getting the copper instead of you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have further discussion on it. We'll post some studies. Um, we'll post some results. I think Dr. William Walsh doesn't totally shut it out i think he just talks about the balance and how that balance is super out of whack in certain humans you know not everybody certain people specifically um the autism and the violent offenders um the violent people or you know schizophrenia is another huge huge which i think 95 percent of the schizophrenic people he tested had too much unbound copper aka copper toxicity you know, and then when he started to help them, um, bringing that down with, with zinc um, supplementation, as well as a few other nutrients, and as well as some dietary changes, a lot of people were able to see better mental, mental health results. Um, yeah, that's true. See, like, you know, copper can definitely contribute to pathologies leading to autism, psychosis, schizophrenia, and even just general anxiety. I think uh, copper can be 
you know, it can increase estrogen as well. It can be very dangerous and it can, yeah. you know, get cause psychotic episodes, you know, if it's introduced at the wrong dose and at the wrong time. So, I mean, again, I think, you know, maybe Dr. Walsh is a little bit more nuanced on the topic than Mr. Smith is. And I was just kind of throwing his name in uh, yeah. at the same time when I shouldn't have. Um, but I appreciate the nuanced conversation that you're willing to have with me about about copper, and I think we, we can both agree that it can be very dangerous and very problematic for people in, in many in many cases, and even maybe ninety percent of or more of the population uh, would be at risk of of um, something bad happening after introducing copper. Um, you know, it might yeah. not be an idea in their context and time in their life. There's a really cool book, and I got to head out to a meeting, but there's a, a really cool book I want you to check out called The Secrets of the Soil. Have you heard of it? No, no, but it sounds interesting. I'd uh, love to yeah. get the reasons. A fascinating story of like these innovative, non-traditional ways that um, certain scientists, farmers, mystics um, are going to like save the planet from self-destruction and help our soil. You know, it's like biodynamic farming. Um, they use a lot of, you know, different techniques. They show a lot of um, fertilizers in history and soils in history. Um, I think one of them was in South America where they had this very fertile, they had this technique, their soil was just naturally depleted. They had this technique to just make. So I think that's another important conversation we have to have is, you know, how do we get, um, that popular. Hey, where was this grown? What, what's the soil like? You know, how do we create more farms that are enriching their soil um, where they're not deficient in the essentials and they're not out of balance with some of the, you know, people say, oh, um, eat oregano and it's great at getting metals out of the body. Yes, but it's also great at getting metals out of that soil that it was grown in. Right. So what what soil was that oregano grown in that you're using to get metals out of your body? You know, it, there's a world where it might be better just to not even eat that, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. so selenium, zinc and copper together are really good for creating metallothionine, which is your body's own endogenous system uh, specifically meant for getting heavy metals out of the body. So I think it'd be more effective than even oregano, cilantro, or chlorella. But um, but again, like if you introduce that copper in your body and your body's not ready, uh, you're yeah. going to feel worse rather than better. Yeah, I wouldn't. If you're growing up eating chocolate and you're in a copper house, if you know you go on Reddit and type in copper IUD, you can go on the Reddit copper IUD. It's not even the negative page it's like the positive page of women who have copper iud's pretty much 99 percent of the posts are just horror stories yeah because it's a highly concentrated um uh, yeah. metal copper inserted straight into uh, the vaginal microbiome that changes so it, it it creates infertility by changing the ph environment of the vagina and so it's also affecting the endocrine system because it's very close. So it'll disturb your hormonal profile. And uh, so you know, copper IUDs are, um, don't, don't use this advice uh, for preventing pregnancy, but I think tracking, tracking periods and being careful around that two week window where you're fertile and just, um, you know, there's, there's some lesser toxic uh, ways of, of, yeah. uh, of, uh, <laughs> yeah, you see, they're using, they're using copper for women to not be able to have children. It's like, Ooh, that's, that's scary in the most absorbent part of their body. Um, but no, great point. All right, man. Anything else you want to closing thoughts, comments, any links or websites, or, you know, tell people where your Twitter is or, just whatever you want to say to close out, man. The floor is yours. One thing is a well water can also be very high in iron. And, and if yeah, and copper. Yeah, and 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 some copper, but the iron 
the iron and copper at the same time makes it even more toxic, right? Because they're both two reactive minerals. So you're taking two reactive minerals at the same time. And, um, you know, that, that can be pretty challenging on the body. And then iron in copper pipes, uh, a lot of the time is chelated with fluoride. So fluoride attaches onto the copper and this becomes like hyper toxic to your body. And so I mean, I distill my own water and I add back the minerals afterwards and, uh, or I just buy spring water at the store. And, uh, yeah, uh, my website is, uh, www.lifresh.me. Um, doesn't work without the www right now. I'm not sure why, but you know, I talk about a lot of, um, these different things, minerals, uh, metabolism, like how how the how the mitochondria work and enzymes are uh, involved in that, basic nutrition. I got a couple low vitamin A diets on there. Um, yeah, my vitamin A section is in the fraud section, which I don't have on the website right now, but it's just livefresh.me slash a. But you gotta put the www, and that I I have some discussion. Um, I'd appreciate your commentary on the, on some of that as well. Um, yeah, no, thank you for having a chat about all of these different things and uh, even getting into some of the more controversial minerals. I know it's very challenging because there's so many people saying different things and, you know, you've got some science pieces that'll, that'll, you know, appear to prove one certain thing and, and then other things that kind of refute but you know hopefully we just you know continue these discussions and you know we find some way just to make it all work um so that we can recover from vitamin a toxicity uh even more rapidly yeah no well said the, the important thing for me here in these early days of one-on-ones podcast is to just bring on people normal not famous influencers not trying to get oh how many followers do you have on so i can share your traffic we have to get people on everyday people who have done this experiment have done this theory and are having successful results and bringing back a state of well-being and happiness and peace and just thriving again right and and you are a prime example of someone who took matters into their own hands and helped yourself a lot you know so give yourself a round of applause you're a leader you're a pioneer you are the real influencer and and thank you for coming on and sharing your story because your story might help someone else be more inclined to experiment with an elimination diet you know experiment with less is more experiment with like throwing away majority of their supplements and not buying as many groceries and just keeping it simple because when you keep it simple guys and when you are boring and basic your liver smiles your liver is happy our livers our kidneys our organs they are workers for us they work for us and the more work you give them the more variables you give them the more stress and that compounds and that affects people's overall health it's that simple you know, and never in the history of the world, especially in the West, did we have these this many things. You got multivitamins, you got fish oils, you got energy drinks, you got every single spice in the book. You got uh, one genre of food for breakfast, another genre for lunch and another style of entertainment for dinner. Multiple times a week, majority of people are ordering out and takeout is at every meal. Those people who are feeding you that takeout food you better believe they are seasoning the hell out of it to get you addicted, to get you more thirsty, to get you on those sugar drinks. It is death by a thousand cuts and you got to be conscious and fight for your rights. And this is one of ones. Nathaniel, thanks for joining us, brother. We'll see yeah, you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well said. Thanks, brother. See you soon. I'm going to end this and then 